Happy Mother's Day. You know, technology seems to plague me every week, but sometimes, you know, we'll get, we'll get through this. But, uh, hey, I want to talk today about a godly mother's heroic faith. And you're probably thinking, what godly mother is he talking about? Well, I want you to meet Moses' mom. In fact, in Hebrews 11, 23, we're going to look through the short passage in 11 in the Hall of Heroes. There's where she's found. But she's just mentioned as Moses' mother. In fact, she's only listed as parent or mother every time Moses uh, is brought up because Moses outshines her. All right? She is the great woman behind the great son. And, uh, and so we only find her name listed in two genealogies. And in this one, I selected because it's easier to, to sort through all the names. And, and her name, the, the text goes before this is talking about it. Her name was Jacobed. Now say that because you'll probably forget it. Jacobed. Come on, say it with me. Jacobed. Not your most uh, usual name. I, I never hear anybody naming their, their daughter Jacobed. Uh, she's one of those forgotten great women of the Bible. Uh, but it says, <clears throat> her name was Jacobed, a descendant of Levi, who was born to the Levites in Egypt. To Amram, she, that was her husband, she bore Aaron, Moses, and their sister Miriam. Now, they're not in the chronological order of birth. Moses was the baby. Miriam was his older sister, but I'm really not sure which one, I, I haven't really checked that out, which one was older between uh, Aaron and, and Miriam, but we know Moses is the baby of the family, okay? Unless she had more children after that because she only, she only appears to give her credit of having Moses, okay? And even when he's referred to, she, She's left out unless you come to a genealogy and then she, she's stuck in. I want to talk about a godly mother's uh, heroic faith from Jacobet. From Jacobet. It says in Hebrews eleven twenty three, 23, by faith Moses' parents hid him three months after he was born. I want to suggest, first of all, that her faith, her heroic faith, is a pro-life faith. You'll see it as we go through this passage. She is pro-life. Now, you've got to know the circumstances behind the birth of Moses to actually get hold of why I would say she has a pro-life faith. First of all, she already has children. Second, they're, they're in Egypt, and in Egypt they are slaves. And so any child she's bringing into the world, she's going to bring into slavery. Not the most comfy of life. You might say, hey, if she could not have a children, it would be a blessing to the child because life is going to be so terrible. And, and, but she, she's pro-life. Now, not only that, but the, the pharaoh, the king of Egypt, had uh, decided that because the Hebrews are multiplying at a faster rate than the Egyptians, that we've got to do genocide. We have to tell the midwives when the baby is being born, while the midwife is on the stool and the baby is going to be delivered, if it's a boy, kill it. Wow. That's infanticide or maybe the beginning of partial birth abortion. Who knows? But if it's a boy, kill the child. But the midwives <laughs> refuse to. You know why? They were pro-life. Why would you be a midwife delivering babies if you were going to kill them? No, not at all. They're pro-life. And, and so that wasn't working. So then the king makes an edict. Every boy that is born to you must be thrown in the Nile. Wow. So the midwives are, when the baby's born, if it's a boy, take it down to the Nile and throw it in. You either sink or swim. Well, you know what happens. The babies will die. So Moses is born under a government edict or law that he is sentenced to death upon birth because of genocide, and it's very, very racial. Only the Hebrew. It's very sex-specific. Only the Hebrew boys. 
and, and they, but he is born to Jochebed, who is very pro-life, because she refuses to do that. Now, the text says, by faith the parents hid Moses for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child. Now, I don't know how moms do that. When the baby's born, my child is exceptional, but I would believe that every mother has that fear. Right? Every mother has that fear. Sometimes they almost have this idea that they know what's, what this child is going to be. I've told you this before, but I brought it today to prove it. My mom, when I was just a little guy, um, she saved some clothes for me. Two outfits that I still have. Believe it or not, I once got into this thing. My, how I have grown. She must have fed me really well. But there are stains all over the side. They're a little faint because actually they're varnished stains. And because I had gotten into some varnish, my mom saved this piece of clothing out of all the clothes I've ever worn because she said, I believe my son is going to be an artist. Whoa, because I spilt varnish all over me? She thought out of her sons, I was the extraordinary one. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. Um, then, then I had a problem because I had <clears throat> a baby brother, and all of a sudden, I wasn't so special. <laughs> I had a baby brother, and, uh, but uh, then when I almost died, Okay, I almost died. Uh, all of a sudden, I usurped his position because I was the son that had died and come back to life. I was now the favorite, and my younger baby brother was fighting to get back his favorite position of being mom's favorite, and he never could for the rest of his life. He couldn't. I was my mom's fa favorite as long as she lived. My mom always had my favorite meal when we all came over. <laughs> Not my brother's. And, and I know you're not supposed to have favorites, but it happens. You can't help that. Even Jesus had favorite disciples. Come on. He had the inner three. No, no. But my mom, she knew when I was a child the artist thing. And, and, and I was, just, at that age, you can't even hold a crayon, okay? Let's, and, and so, but then as a, a teenager, um, you know, my mom saw that I was kind of gifted in art. And so she went to a conference. And at the conference, there was uh, all these books out, and she bought me some books. I, I have them right here. She bought me these books. And, and I saw this chalk artist when I was 16, and uh, uh, at a banquet, he did a chalk drawing. And I came home, and I told him all about it, and said, you know what, I can do that. I can do that. Well, I didn't know that as soon as I said I can do that, she said one minute, and she went back into the bedroom, and she came out with these books. Ideas for chalk artist. How to be a chalk artist. Your chalk uh, says can talk. And she said, oh, I got these for you, Dennis. I was just waiting for you to want them. <laughs> uh, how does a mom do that? You know, I really don't know how they do that. Um, they just do. They just do. Moses' mom knew this was no ordinary child. I don't know if that meant he'd be driving home on the double hump camel from, you know, the midwife station. And, uh, you know, that. but she knew within the first three months that God had something really special. You know, I'm afraid I'll forget to tell you this later, but I don't think she lived long enough to even... Hmm. Some of you have been praying for your children your whole life and you wonder if they'll ever come around. I don't think she ever saw her son come to his ultimate greatness in her life. She probably died while he was leading a bunch of slaves. 
Wow. That's the thing about a mom. A mom, a mom believes in her child as we go along. She has this discerning faith. She's so in touch with God that God almost gives her premonitions about the child. And she believes in the child when no one else believes. She has a discerning faith. Discerning. I also say she has a fearless faith because her son is born under a death threat. It says, by faith, Moses' parents, Jacobed, hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was the, the, that he was no extra or I mean, that he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. They didn't care about that law. This is a mother who will die for her child. I call that pro-life. She's pro-life. To such a degree that she will exchange her own life for her child's life. You know, this is a godly mother's heroic faith that she would do that. In fact, in the New Testament, it says this. God, has, God gave us a spirit not of fear. She was not afraid of the king. She was not afraid of the king. But God has given us a spirit of power and of love and self-control. You see, when you're afraid, you, are, you feel powerless. When you're afraid, you feel like the circumstances are so bad. I, I'm afraid. I, I, I ha there's nothing I can do. I, I have no power to overcome them, and, and I get very fearful. But God gave us not a spirit of fear, but a power. I am empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. She was empowered to say, I don't care what the king says. I have to obey God rather than men. Those are the words of Peter in the book of Acts. I am not going to yield to the king. I'm going to yield to God. You see, when a godly mother, all godly mothers are pro-life. They're, they're for the life of the child. It cost me my own life. That's what love is. You, you see, love, the opposite of love is self-centeredness. Real love means I will sacrifice for the other person. No matter how good or how bad they are, I will sacrifice for them. That's what Jesus did on the cross. While we were yet sinners, nothing lovely about us. We're very unlovely. He said, I love you so much, I'll go to the cross and I'll die for you. That is love. The opposite of love is, oh, I don't care what happens to you. When I put it in a modern framework, in a modern time, it is, uh, it's all about me. The baby will be a distraction to my career, so the baby has got to go. But the pro-life mother says, no, I love my child. I love it from the time, my child from the time he or she has been conceived. I love my child, and I will do whatever it takes for my child to live, to live. And self-control, self-control. The godly mother does not get all frantic and frazzled. The godly mother knows what to do. You pray and you strategize. You strategize. Brings me to the next part of a heroic, godly mother's faith. It's a strategic faith. Very strategic. It says, I'm jumping to Exodus now to the longer version of this story. We have the short version in the book of Hebrews where she's listed among the hall of all the great heroes of the faith. And now we go back to the historical record in Exodus. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket. I searched the internet to find one. I found this black and white and tried to color it so it looked like really nice in the slide. But it didn't matter anyway because the text goes on to say she got this basket and she pitched it. She coated it with tar and pitch. And I knew if I colored it all black, you'd say, what in the world is that big black blob up on the screen? I knew that. I don't know where she got it. Maybe she went down to the local Egyptian market and she bought it. Maybe she made it. But she made the basket. Now, the interesting thing here to me is, in the Hebrew text, the word translated basket is actually the word ark. Isn't that interesting? 
very interesting. In her strategy, say, what has God done before that he could do again? I like that thought. Maybe she was thinking, hey, back in the day of Noah, God was, God was going to destroy everything and everyone, and the only means of salvation was an ark. I need an ark for my baby boy. Wow, I don't know, maybe that went through her head. But she said, ah, I'm going to get a papyrus ark, a little basket. Back in the Old Testament, before her time, probably, uh, let's see, about, uh, I don't know, a thousand years or more, God said to, to, to Noah, make yourself an ark out of cypress wood. Well, she didn't have cypress wood, oh, but I, hey, I'm down in Egypt, we got a lot of papyrus. I get a papyrus ark. And so she went out and she got a papyrus ark. And, it's, and God told, told Noah to coat it with pitch inside and out. Now, some of us have been down to the ark down in Kentucky, right? They forgot one thing when they did it. They forgot to pitch the outside so it was all black. Ark, right? Yeah, they left it all wood so you can see the, the construction of it. But, and, and so where did she get the idea? I'm thinking she said, well, hey, God saved Noah and his family in an ark. Duh, maybe God can save my child in an ark pitched inside and out, and she gets the ark, she pitches it, and then she's got to float it. She takes it down to the Nile River. This is all what she's doing. At this point, she's got the strategy, it's in place, but now she's got to trust the strategy She's got to trust God. There's a lot of she's got to trust. She finally realizes, my child is no longer going to be in my care, in my charge, in my control. This is mind-blowing, isn't it, Mom? To take your child down. She placed the child in the basket, and she put it along the reeds, along the banks of the Nile. I think she strategically placed it. She had that so it would be seen by a special someone. She's got a strategy, but she's also now, she's trusting this strategy that she's taken, I believe, from the Bible, and, and she's trusting the God of the Scriptures. She's trusting her daughter. Older sister Miriam comes in at this point. In her strategy, she's got her daughter going to keep track of the basket while it's there. His sister Miriam stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. And sure enough, according to the strategy, she's got this trust now in her daughter. She's got trust in God. She's got trust in the basket. She's got trust in God's providence that Pharaoh's daughter would go down to that location at the Nile to bathe. That's where she did her bathing. She'd go down to the Nile, and she had all of her entourage, her attendants who were with her. They walked down along the riverbank, and notice the text says, she... The princess of Egypt, the daughter of Pharaoh, saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girls down into the water to retract it from the water. And then when they brought it up to her, she opened that ark and saw the baby. He was crying. <laughs> Cry baby Moses. But you know the cry is so cute when they're so small. Pharaoh's daughter doesn't know in a few years he's going to have a cry that he's not going to like. <laughs> she saw the baby cry. Her heart was filled with emotion. I don't know if Pharaoh's daughter had any other children at this point, or if she ever, ever had any after that text doesn't tell me. She sees the baby. And she becomes pro-life too. Isn't that the way it works? Isn't that the way it works? One of the fears of those who don't believe pro-life is when the baby is born, I'm going to love it and I won't be able to give it up for adoption. <laughs> and so I, 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 I just rather not have the baby. Now here, she sees the baby in a moment seeing the baby. She says, this is one of those, she, oh, wait, she felt sorry for him. Her heart was just filled with compassion. She loves the baby immediately upon sight. I gotta be honest, 
I don't know that I've ever seen an ugly baby. Have you? <laughs> Even the ones you think are ugly, they turn out, you know, to be the beautiful one. She sees the baby. She's moved with compassion. Her heart goes out. She feels sorry for him. And she says, this is one of the Hebrew babies. Do you get the picture here? He was taken down to the river of death. He was placed in the river, but he had an ark. The whole picture is beautiful. We're born in sin too. The wages of sin is death. It's taking us down. But we have an ark, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we put our faith in the ark Jesus, he saves us from the drowning waters of death and sin. It's a beautiful picture. And who does it? This Egyptian looks upon a Hebrew they're trying to eliminate, and it's a boy of all things, and her heart is moved with compassion, and she says, I want this baby. That's what she says. She is the Savior. She represents Jesus the Savior who wants us. And it's beautiful, beautiful metaphor here. Beautiful, beautiful. It's just then the strategy continues to kick in. Jacobed's trusting Miriam that she's going to do her part. She's going to go over and speak up. And, and then his, his sister asks Pharaoh. See, she jumps in on the scene. Just so happens to be there. Of course, strategically planted. She says, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Now, this is strategized. She doesn't say, I know who that kid is. Oh, that's my little baby brother. <laughs> no, 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 no. She's playing dumb. Oh, let me, let me help you here. And, and so she said, well, yes, go, she answered. And the world, the, the, it says, and, and the girl went and got the baby's mother. Oh, my goodness. There's a verse in the, in the New Testament that says, all things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. She's trusting God and God's providence and everything's falling into place. I think as she had kind of strategized, I don't think it's all happening by accident. I'm sure she spent those three months praying, God, how am I going to rescue my son? How am I going to rescue my son? And that passage from Genesis as a light bulb went off in her head and now she's executing the plan. This is beautiful. She went and got the mother and here's where it really gets beautiful. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me. Here it is. And I'll pay you. <laughs> I'm going to pay you to take care of your child for me. Wow. It's a beautiful, it's so beautiful. God's blessings come in so many unusual ways. The baby is spared, and the mother hasn't missed a day of, weaning, of breastfeeding the child, and she's supposed to now breastfeed him and do what Pharaoh's daughter's not going to be able to do, take care of him until she can bring him back to Pharaoh's daughter. She's a trusting God. She's got great faith, a trusting faith. Not just in her head, it's moved to her heart, and it's moved into her hands, She's been doing actively what she believes. This is no, um, oh yeah, I believe. This is I am totally all in committed to trusting God to take care of my child. And this is what I call heroic faith, heroic. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. Whoa. She adopted out her daughter, I mean her, her son, to Pharaoh's daughter. God in his providence used adoption as a means of being pro-life. I believe with all my heart if Jacobed was here today, she would be pro-life and she would vote pro-life because that's what godly women do. That's what they do. She would be pro-adoption and anti-abortion because that's what godly women do. That had to be the hardest day of her life. 
She is giving her son, but she's trusting God. The God of providence, she's trusting God. She's giving her son to the enemy. You do get that, right? Giving a Hebrew baby boy to an Egyptian who is out to destroy the Hebrew boys so they don't reproduce more Hebrews. Remember, it's genocide going on. And she is trusting God to give her son to a pagan woman to raise. She believes that strongly in life. She believes she's still alive. She's trusting God. So then it says, and she named him Moses. The she here is Pharaoh's daughter. Named him Moses. Now Moses is a Hebrew name, because it goes on saying, I drew him out of the water. Why would an Egyptian adopting a son give him a Hebrew name? Probably because she didn't. You ever heard of the name Tutmos? Tutmos? Pharaoh Tutmos? Or how about Ramsey? Ever heard of Ramses? Well, the M-S in there, M-S-S, and cut most, the most part, is Moses. When you bring it over, it sounds like that. In Egypt, it sounds one way. You pronounce it in Hebrew the other way. You say Moses. Cut most, it's the word most, Moses there, and, or Ramses, the Mazes on the end, uh, are the letters for Moses, if you bring them over into Hebrew. And all it means is son of, son of. So, Tutmos was son of Tut. Ramses is son of Ra, and Ra was a god, so they felt that this was, the, the Pharaoh was the son of the god Ra, so he's deity, and that's why they worship their king. I'm not sure if Moses didn't have a little preface in front of that, okay? And then the Hebrews all said, well, it's the Hebrew Moses. It's the Hebrew Moses. And he was drawn out of the water. And he gets his name Moses because she takes him out of the water. That which was supposed to be death to Moses, he's resurrected out of the dead by taking him out through the Ark of Salvation. Listen, this is a gospel message in the Old Testament. Are you seeing it? I hope you're seeing it. Just like Jesus Christ, he's gone to the waters of death, but now he's raised up. But he's not like Jesus at all because Moses is a sinner just like all the rest of us and he needs Jesus as his Savior. He's just a picture of the Savior to come. But she, the mom, I just can't get past. Jacobed had a faith that truly believed God, that God was going to do something with her extraordinary child. And she would never get to see the full extraordinariness of him because she gives him away in adoption to the Egyptian Pharaoh's daughter. In Hebrews, back to the book of Hebrews, it's summarizing this whole story. It says, now by faith, Moses, turns to Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I don't know what transpired there. He knew that uh, he was a Hebrew, Probably they reminded him, you're just an adopted kid around here. Don't think you're going to get to the throne because you're Hebrew. It's going to be an Egyptian that gets to the throne. Uh, Pharaoh's daughter may like you a lot. Consider you her son. I don't know what's going on, but something's going on in the background here because when he had grown up, he refused to be the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with God, the people of God. Wow. Notice it says, he chose. This faith of his is generational, and, and somehow he's not been raised by his mom. His mom hasn't taken him down to the synagogue. He's not been trained, you know, at the family devotion time. But somehow this extraordinary child makes a choice, a wise choice, a faith choice that I'm going to identify with my family that are slaves. And the text says here, with the people of God. I'm going to choose Jesus over Egypt. 
He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Listen, every one of us knows that there's pleasure in sin. When you cave into it, you have that euphoria, whatever it is. Whether you steal, like I told you last week, the communion cup. And you put it in your pocket. A little later, all of a sudden, you're just burning. It is that guilt that sets in. I enjoyed it immediately. I got it. It's mine. And then later, when I realized I stole from the Lord, oh my goodness, the guilt that set in. I, the, the pleasure was just seasonal. I don't care what pleasure it is. I don't care if it's a sexual sin, a financial sin, of cheating on your taxes. I don't care what it is. Your conscience kicks in, and, and that, that pleasure you got from that sin was very short season. And Moses, Moses, says, I'd rather be a slave to the Lord than have all the pleasures of Egypt goes on and it says, he regarded the disgrace. You see, he's, he's being disgraced. When he chooses to go with the Hebrew people, he's gone to the bottom of society, the slaves, rather than to be in the king's court. So what a disgrace. He said, I'd rather be disgraced for the sake of Christ. I love this passage. This passage tells me that those Old Testament believers, when they put their trust in the Lord, because Jesus Christ is the Lord, they were putting their faith in Jesus Christ, even though they didn't know him by the name Jesus Christ. He is the same Lord. And so Moses, he, did, he, he said, I'd rather be a slave for Jesus than be the prince of the devil. It's a christ done thing. He goes on, he says, I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world can afford. The splendors of Egypt were tremendous, tremendous. But he said, I'd rather have Jesus. Ah. Final line that is in that Hebrew passage about it. It says he had a reason. Because he was looking ahead to his reward. To his reward. He was looking ahead. He was not short-sighted. He wasn't just fixed on the here and now. You see, the here and now is just that little tiny dot, that speck in life. I love this illustration. You should have it memorized by now. Your life is merely a tiny dot. A tiny dot. And some of us were just at the beginning of that dot. Some are in the middle of that dot. And some are towards the end of that dot. But it is a dot. And the older we get, the more true it is, time flies. It is just flying right by. That's our life. But then there's the line of eternity that goes on and on and on and on. And I'm off, off the camera, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> eternity just goes on and on and on. It never ends. And on and on and on and on and on. What you believe in this dot. He believed they'd rather suffer for Jesus in the dot. Because what you believe determines where you spend the line. In the dot, if you believe in Jesus, you spend the line forever, eternity, with Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, the Creator, our Redeemer. You spend eternity with Him. And what you do in the dot, once you believe, tells you what kind of reward you get for all eternity, all eternity. He says he was looking ahead to his reward. He was motivated by the eternal rather than the temporary. That's what a heroic faith does. Heroic faith says, oh, this is all so temporary. Why would I waste all eternity on a little seasonal pleasure when I can have eternal reward. So I've given you eight reasons today to honor mom. If you are under 50 years old, you can honor mom because she was pro-life. 49 years ago, 
our Supreme Court made a decision. There's no law involved here. Congress makes law. They made a decision. We've been governed by a decision of a court, not by law, for the last 49 years about death. If you're here, you can honor your mom just by saying, thank you, mom, for being pro-life. <laughs> you gave me birth. You gave me birth. Yeah. Secondly, for her being discerning, you know the areas in which your mom saw you and pushed you and encouraged you, and, and the dividend is paid off. It may have been a, a, a direction of occupation or go on to college, or it may be, I don't know what it was. But it was her influence in your life. She had a discernment in your life. And, and you know what it is. It's popped into your mind already. That she was fearless. She was courageous. She encouraged you. You can, you can honor her for that. Listen, you can honor her for having a strategic influence on you. You can honor her for trusting God and God's providence. And at times it was hard for her to let you do your own thing so that you would just learn by the lesson of life to come back to where she is, all right? You, you, for her trusting faith in God for you. You, you can honor her for her generational faith, that, that she's tried every way she can to pass it on to you. you. You can honor her for that. You can honor her for her Christ-centeredness, that she loves Jesus. Because we're talking about a godly mother's heroic faith. And you can honor your mom for rewarding her rewarding faith that she is not so preoccupied with the now as she is with the eternal. You can do that. And you know what? Those of you who are ladies here, you, you women here, you can be this heroic mom. Be pro-life. Have spiritual discernment. Have a spiritual fearlessness about you. Develop a, a faith strategy. Make your faith trust and not just hope. All right? You, you can have a Christ-centered faith. You, you can look towards eternity for the reward. You can be this heroic, godly mother kind of faith person. You can do this. So... The goal today is for you to honor mom and for you to be a mom of, mom of honor. And because we want to honor you, we have something for you. We have a little tiny keychain. And on the keychain, it says, woman of faith. There's a cross. There's a pearl. Not a real one, okay? <laughs> and there's a heart. A little keychain. Put that on, on your keys and you got that little thing dangling around in your purse. Every time you pull that out, it'll be a reminder. I want to be a heroic mother woman of faith. The heroic. That's what I want to be for my kids, right? My grandkids. So we're going to give one to all the ladies when, uh, while they're singing. Uh, my wife and I are going to run around and pass them all out to you. You didn't know that, but that's what we're going to do. <laughs> That's because of my old age. I forgot to ask some kids to do it. <laughs> and uh, we got plenty here. Every woman gets one. Every young girl gets one. We're giving them to all the moms, grandmoms, and future moms, and potential moms, and wannabe moms, uh, all of them that play with their dolls that they are mom. We're giving them no guys get these. I know in our culture today, you think you can change who you are. It's not happening. No, 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 no. Moses was a boy from birth. God designed who he was. Even if he felt like he wanted to play with his sister's dolls, he was still a boy just playing with sister dolls. He was a boy. Okay, these are just for the gals today. And what I want to do is just... I want to pray for the mom, okay? Let's do this. Father in heaven, we have heroic mothers here, like Jacobet. I ask that you would just rain down upon them, pour out on them your blessing. We have moms like Jacobet 
who pray for their, their children every day and perhaps not even in their lifetime will they see the answer to that prayer. For surely Jochebed died long before Moses ever started to lead the nation of Israel at 80 years old. Now, Father, I, her prayers for her child all her life were realized. Encourage our mothers to pray every day without relenting for their children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Bless these mothers, Lord, with your good hand being upon them so that they are influencing generations yet to come. There are young women here who will become mothers. And we pray, O oh God, that they will be godly mothers, knowing Jesus Christ, choosing to suffer for Jesus rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Bless them, O oh God, that, that these children that are here, the young ladies, the boys, that they will come to embrace Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord at a young age. And it will be easy for mothers to communicate and train them up in the way that they should go. Bless on this Mother's Day, Lord, that we will have great women of faith right here at Bethany Church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.